Great, good evening. My name is Nairi Woods. I'm the founding dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. And it's a great pleasure to be moderating uh, this session at the World Economic Forum this year. Uh, let me just point a small logistical detail out. Uh, I have here an iPad on which your questions will appear. I'm not exactly sure how you get your question onto my iPad, but um, apparently there will be instructions put on a slide. But I would welcome your questions right from the beginning of this session. I'd love it to be a conversation. So let's do that right there. I'm going to introduce you to our panelists in a moment. But before we move to that, I'd just like to introduce tonight's topic by saying that last year at Davos, we all were invited to master the fourth industrial revolution, greatly helped by Klaus Schwab's excellent book on the subject. This year, a different challenge has sharpened. People across Europe and across the United States have in a way risen up and said, we don't feel we belong and we don't feel we're being heard by leaders in the public sector and sometimes leaders in the private sector. The Klaus Schwab proposed to us on the eve of this year's World Economic Forum that that fact means that we all have to now focus on responsive and responsible leadership. And he put to us the idea that a good leader has radar and a compass. So think about what President Xi Jinping told us this morning. If we want to cross the ocean, we can't retreat back into the harbor every time there's a storm. So the leaders in this room certainly need radar to know what citizens are thinking and wanting and concerned about. You certainly need a compass, as Professor Schwab tells us, the values that are gonna take you forward. But I think we need to add one thing. You need a crew. You need to bring people along with you. Governments across the world need a narrative that helps people to feel that they do belong, that they are being heard. That's one way that they can start to rebuild trust. So what we're going to do on tonight's panel is we're going to share, have these panelists share their wisdom on where we are at the beginning of 2017 and what are the ways that we can begin to rebuild trust and to manage the fourth industrial revolution in a way that helps societies come together more cohesively, more prosperously. And I'd like to start by turning to Dr. Vishal Sikha, the CEO of Infosys. Vishal, you're the son of a railways engineer. You saw technology at that phase and you're also a surfer, so you know all about dodging the waves. Um, what's the disruption that we most need to pay attention to that's coming from the new technologies? And, and why? Why should we pay so much attention to the, dis to the disruption? I think the, uh, if you look at the, um, the, the way the people are affected, as you described, um, and all the geopolitical changes that are happening, they're all happening within the wider context of the technological disruption that is impacting all of us. And in particular, the development and the advance of, of AI technology. I think that a artificial intelligence and certainly the advance that we have seen just in the last one year and certainly in the last few years, when I look back on this time compared to when I was a PhD student studying AI, it is staggering. And yet in many ways, we are in the beginnings of this technology and the revolution. And in many ways, we face the prospect of leaving a larger swath of humanity behind us um, in the light of this technology than any technology that we have ever created. So we need to be extra careful, extra conscious, uh, put in an extra effort to ensure that we don't create a bigger divide, uh, that we don't create a even bigger society of have-nots, that the technology that we build now is in service of everyone. Uh, and that means education a deep commitment to education. That means a, a deep commitment to helping people bridge this displacement gap 
uh, when technologies disrupt jobs and, and so forth. Uh, that means uh, creating a sense of we can create and reshape the future of these technologies for our future in a way that benefits everyone and doesn't leave large parts of humanity behind. That's what I see. So, so in Britain, in the United States, in other countries in Europe, it feels as though people are staging a mutiny. The crew are not with established governments and established leaders. Is that happening in India? Um, Is there a fear of mutiny or a risk of mutiny? I think, uh, and Mukesh Bhai can speak about this in um, much more richness. The, uh, I think in India, there is a tremendous opportunity. There is a, um, it's a in, India is a young country. India is a technologically advanced country. Uh, there, India is a very entrepreneurial country in ways that are not seen in the outside. And yet when you look at the recent um, uh, demonetization that was done in India, you can see both of these aspects at play. Mm -hmm. The opportunity that technology can create and the way that some of these disruptions can really affect the, com the, the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is both yes and no, depending on how we look at India. Mm -hmm. But perhaps Mukesh Bhai can speak about this in more detail. Well, let me move straight to Mukesh then. Mukesh Ambani, you've watched Reliance grow from being a $1 million company to being a $70 billion company. That's extraordinary growth. But in a country where there's a lot of poverty, and there's also a fantastic democratic tradition of rebellion. <laughs> what, what's your view on the disruption in India? Well, I think uh, if we first start with uh, what Vishal said in terms of uh, how do people, how does humanity progress and how do we as a society progress? Right? I think that at uh, this time, in India, we are blessed with uh, having very strong leadership from our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi. He has painted a vision for India which creates foundation because when you embrace technology, you should use technology for the good of all people. And I think that uh, the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution really are all inclusive and will benefit all. And uh, they require a sense of foundation. And let me you know, quickly just tell you what Vishal said. So even if we are a very young country, we have uh, 200 million of our 1.2 billion in schools. And clearly, education needs to transform itself. The fastest way that we can transform education in a big country like India is use technology. It's the biggest equalizer. It can produce results in not decades, but in the next three to five years. And that can then create and benefit all. So for all of this, you really need a foundation. And you need for a country and a society to embrace rather than isolate itself. To as uh, Premier Z said in the morning that uh, if the world is interconnected by oceans, you don't need to divide it into rivers and lakes. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true when you want to embrace uh, technology. So from that point of view, yes. I also believe that uh, all the components of technology, and particularly the fourth industrial revolution technologies, are all inclusive. So in a sense, they are the biggest equalizer for a country like India, for our, all our 1.2 billion people. We in India have uh, a foundation where we have got an identity system for over 1.1 billion people. This will then enable us, right, with the recent demonetization and the movement to digital cash. Uh, so far, India has been only what I call a high value, low volume credit transaction. So the common man, the ordinary man, the people whose voice uh, everybody should hear, right, had no access to credit. I think that that can change very, very fast with embracement of technology. And you know, there can be many such uh, examples. So in summary, what is happening in India is that we are embracing 
technology for leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, young people are embracing technology. Society is moving. And in the last 90 days, because of demonetization, we've had a major movement to what I call less cash or digital cash. Mm -hmm. And people have accepted that. Mm -hmm. There is uh, support at the grassroots level, because in the end, they think it is for a better life for mm -hmm. themselves. And as long as mm -hmm. uh, we are responsible to deliver that. And I believe that the fourth industrial revolution technologies can deliver that. It'll do well. But can I ask you very personally, you know, the world, many, many people across the world are saying that globalization has been managed, you know, by folks like all of us and has benefited the top 1% much, much more than anyone else. That's in sharp focus now. What do you feel personally as, your, as one of the 1%? So what's your personal responsibility? Is it to support your government to distribute better? Is it to, how, how do you see that moving forward? How do you see your own responsibility moving forward? Well, I think that it is very important that opportunities are given equally to all. Right? And what interconnected, like we have all 7 billion people in this world are in a sense should be connected and they should have a shared destiny and shared prosperity. Doing that, right, once you have access to opportunity, you first have to create wealth before you can distribute wealth. Mm -hmm. So for a country like India, mm -hmm. I am extremely committed and as I have seen the wealth creation on a grassroots basis, right? Uh, it's important that to raise standards of living and quality of life for all our billion people, we give a fair share of opportunity to everybody, give education to everybody, embrace the free market for creation of wealth. And then once wealth is created, right, distribution is the easier problem to have, but you shouldn't shun creation of wealth creation of wealth is more important than distribution of wealth. Right. I mean, I think in a lot of parts of the world, people are saying, yes, we've been hearing that for 30 years, but it looks as though the distribution is becoming more and more skewed to the top 1%. Mark Benioff, you're chair and CEO of Salesforce, um, and you tell me a committed ukulele player. Um, but how do you see the responsibility of the 1% who have so benefited from globalization? Yeah. Well, for me, when I started uh, Salesforce uh, you know, 17 years ago, I thought a lot about how do we integrate companies more deeply into society? How do we get back? How do we um, support many of the NGOs that are here? That's why when we started our company, we put 1% of our equity, our profit, and our time into a, a nonprofit, an NGO called Salesforce.org. It was easy at the time because we had no employees, we had no products or equity. Uh, but today, of course, you know, we are a company with a market cap of 50 something billion dollars and we have 25,000 employees. And so we've been able to give back um, um, hundreds of millions of dollars, but also millions of hours of volunteerism. And we run 30,000 nonprofits and NGOs, and many of them are here. Uh, for free on our services. Equality and the equality crisis certainly is a child of globalization. You know, the access to capital and the access to this technology that is really available to so few then really gives them this kind of incredible unfair advantage and up they have gone. I think, coming back to Vishal's comment, I think that when we look at what's happening right now in technology, um, this, this is the moment, I think, when we have the highest level of anxiety because we can see advancements in artificial intelligence that are beyond what we um, even expected. It's happening at a rate and capability that we're worrying that um, how, how will this impact um, uh, the everyman and also the, 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 the broad, broad range of workers across the world. This year, my heart has been with so many migrants and refugees who, um, 65 million refugees across the world, and uh, these t touching stories and, 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 and thinking about 
um, how they're going to get back to stability in homes. I, I think now about how artificial intelligence will create digital refugees mm -hmm. and how people will be displaced from jobs, tens of millions of people across the planet because technology is moving forward so rapidly, creating much lower cost, much easier to use, and much more capable uh, work environments. So companies, individuals, uh, very people that we have here, we have to decide, are we going to be committed to supporting uh, and improving uh, this uh, state of the world, or are we just going to kind of let this go as it is? And so we're really at a very, we're at a crucial, crucial point right now. Uh, I'm Sorry, convinced can, of it. Can I just uh, follow up? So what's the solution to that? You've just painted a picture of hundreds of thousands, millions of people who will no longer have jobs. And, and what is it that you think leaders should be doing now to ensure that those people feel included and heard in the societies in which they live? Well, I think that you know that throughout history, technology has displaced workers, but then workers have the opportunity to be trained or retrained or vocational training or education or supported. And today, there's more people working in the world than there ever has been in the history of the world, mm -hmm. as evidence of that point. So we're at a very good place, actually. Now, obviously, there's 200 million youth, you know, who are unemployed. That's a, a terrible statistic that we need to focus on. There is, you know, uh, pockets of dramatic unemployment throughout the world, even where I live in the United States. But we are at a point where it's possible that this technology could accelerate to the point where we'll see this kind of creation of these uh, digital refugees. And I think that that is something that we really need to be mindful of and start having these very serious conversations, multi-stakeholder dialogues, honestly, you know, where we can bring together corporate leaders, government leaders, social leaders, NGOs. Only through a multi-stakeholder dialogue are we going to get this answer. There is no, you know, clear path forward. Mm -hmm. And as Vishal said so well, all this has just happened, you know, in a matter of months. So we are really just on the, just, you know, it's a fairly recent um, observation of what, what's happening today. So it's quite, it's quite, and you know, it's an amazing time. That's why we call it the fourth industrial revolution. This is incredible what is happening. All these things at once, cloud computing, mobile computing, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, all these things are happening all at once. So well articulated in mm -hmm. Professor Schwab's book. So, and what's the thing that's happened just in the last few months to which you're referring? Well, the advancements in artificial intelligence, the mm -hmm. ability for the software to learn mm -hmm. more rapidly than we, we mm -hmm. expected. Mm -hmm. um, can I move to Mary Barra? Um, Mary, you grew up child of a dye maker, and, but put yourself through college, and you've been at GM 36 years. Um, your crew probably trust you a lot. In fact, there's lots of evidence that they do. But you're in a car industry that's negotiating difficult waters. Some would say that the government in the United States is threatening to do what President Xi Jinping this morning said, to retreat, to retreat back to its own harbor or to require its companies to retreat back to their own harbor. Um, what's your strategy in those difficult waters? Well, you know, clearly the, in clearly the, the industry, uh, the, the auto industry is undergoing, you know, rapid transformation as almost every industry is in uh, not only, you know, advancements in, I'll say, the traditional owner-driver model, but then, you know, the opportunities with autonomous that, you know, do provide a lot of societal benefit when you think about the fact that uh, whether it's it's the population that can't, uh, doesn't have the skills to drive uh, or the physical ability to drive, Autonomous really provides uh, freedom of getting from point A to point B, which for all of us that can do that is is a huge benefit. So, you know, we look at the technology are coming, we see how it is going to improve for society, but you know, we have to look at how how are those shifts going to be made, and and how do we manage that business? And you know, clearly. Uh, articulating the vision so our employees, it's for us I think it starts with our employees and our customers of understanding and, and building the trust of here's where we're going and you know here's how things will change 
and, and how we have to adapt, but then also pr providing a roadmap. I've talked about the fact that you need to be incredibly transparent. In order to have trust, people, people have to, you, you really have to paint the picture and, and not only share the good news, but share the difficult news, and then the solutions are you're going to move forward. One of the other key areas, and, and a couple of the other panelists have mentioned, is education. And we're at, at General Motors investing a lot in not only educating our existing um, employees for the new technical skills that are going to be needed, but also reaching deep um, into all the communities in which we we live and work in the education systems there of how can we support to make sure um, there's more STEM uh, education involved. And we just got involved with a, girl, a strategic partnership was announced with Girls Who Code because when you look at um, and, and deep diving into the middle school to make sure young girls are, are not making decisions at that point that are going to you know, really make it more difficult for them to get involved in a technology field because technology is a part of almost every industry. So you know, there's an obligation that we feel from to our employees in communicating and painting the picture of where they're going and providing the roadmaps that you know, each individually eventually has to be accountable for, but then also reaching deeper into making sure that as the workforce as we grow the workforce, as, as you know, children enter the workforce and, be, and young adults, that they've got the skills that are going to be necessary. Because right now, not only do we have uh, some that are unemployed, but we also have areas where you know, there's, there's jobs available and we don't have people with the skill set. So if you, if you fast forward 10 years in your industry, will it be mostly robots? You know, I mean, I still think the traditional owner-driver model of I get in, you know, drive my own vehicle. I mean, think about there's markets around the world that, you know, they aspire to have that type of personal mobility. I think autonomous, if you put yourself, if you put um, the customer in the center and look at how do I add pe value to people's lives, um, you know, it's going to be the full range from the model we know today to dense urban areas that autonomous is going to make sense because it reduces congestion. Uh, you know, driving isn't that... Um, uh, remarkable when you're in stop and go traffic with no place to park. And so if you look at solving real issues for, for the customer, I think there's going to be a wide variety of solutions for a very long time. But I guess I'm asking, um, when President-elect Trump um, suggests to a different company that they should produce their cars in America, not Mexico, there's an assumption that the jobs will go to American workers instead of Mexican workers, but surely in the end it's just going to go to American robots. You know, the people who make I, I the think cars. that's a bit of a jump. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a jump. Having uh, been in uh, the company for 36 years and yep. actually worked in the area where, you know, when you look from a, from a workforce perspective, yes, there's automation that's used, but when you need flexibility and you think about the customization that happens in our industry, the most flexible uh, uh, asset is, is a human being that mm -hmm. can do, do different things. So I still think it's going to be a blend. I, I see it every day. Um, and so... I, I, I think that's oversimplifying what's really going to happen. Thank you. Um, chairman Xu, can I come to you? You're chairman of uh, China's um, electricity grid company. You grew up in the countryside outside yes. of Beijing. Uh, yes. um, your parents had no electricity, but you were part of a generation that did have electricity, and yes. you were telling me about your love of reading, no <laughs> doubt, with electric light. I doubt you dreamt that you would be heading China's electricity grid company. Did you dream that as a child? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And now you're there, you've got a tough job because yeah. the Chinese people, the Chinese government say that they have a crisis of polluted air, polluted food, polluted water. And yet you've got a billion people to provide energy for. And you're right at the heart of that. Yeah. Is technology going to help you do that? Yes, yes. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, uh, I'm an electrical engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, I, have been, I have been working uh, for the power industry uh, over 35 years already. Uh, yes, uh, in my childhood, it just started uh, to uh, electrification in the mm -hmm. rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, China's power industry is uh, very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, Steel grid of China, corporation of China, uh, ranked number two mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, five, uh, Fortin, uh, global Fortune 500, number mm -hmm. two now. And uh, with a turnover 
are over three, uh, 300 billion US dollars. And uh, we are facing a lot of uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, China energy sector, the coal uh, is dominated. Mm -hmm. So uh, how to uh, uh, provide the electricity to the 1.3 billion people, and also with uh, clean and uh, clean and uh, clean and safe and reliable energy. That's our challenge. Uh, for many years, we have put a lot of uh, put a lot of effort on that. Uh, the first uh, one is a technology innovation. Mm -hmm. So in my company, we have invented the UHV uh, technology. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, UHV technolo technology means we have, uh, we upgrade. Uh, the, uh, the voltage mm -hmm. of the transmission. Mm -hmm. So in China, in my company, we have 1,100 uh, plus and minus 1,100 kV transmission lines. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we have uh, invented the 800 kV UHVDC technology. With that technology, uh, the, uh, with the UHVDC technology, we can transmit the power from the west part of the country to the east part. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the west, we have a plentiful uh, of the water uh, uh, resources and the coal resources. Especially, we have uh, uh, the renewable energy located in the west. So how to uh, transmit the large part of the power to the uh, load center in the mm -hmm. east areas? Mm -hmm. So last week, a couple of your cities were asphyxiating in the smog. How, it's a race, isn't it? You need to get electricity to the poorest parts of China. Yes. But yeah. mm -hmm. your cities have to be livable. Yeah. And they're becoming unlivable. Yeah. So can you win that race? Yeah. We, uh, uh, we, we have uh, made achievements for, for the power for all. Mm -hmm. every, uh, every household in China now uh, can be excess of the mm -hmm. ele electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's our, uh, put a lot of effort on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, now in China, even you live in the very remote mm -hmm. areas, you can no problem mm -hmm. to use the electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about the other panelists have yeah. talked about the, the kind of reactions to globalization. Yeah. President Xi Jinping mentioned yeah. it this morning. Yeah. I remember being in China when China was acceding to the WTO, and there was a very lively debate about the pros and cons of globalization. But is there, is there an anti-globalization movement yeah. in China? Is there a concern that, that people are worried that the reason why their air is dirty is because of globalization? Is that part of what you're thinking about? Yeah. Uh, in the morning, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping gave a, a very important speech. After president speech, I heard a lot of uh, discussions from the audience, from the uh, colleagues. Uh, they think uh, they all uh, think president uh, speech gave first one gave a confidence mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, world society. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they gave the confidence for China uh, economy. Mm -hmm. uh, gave us a. Uh, a clean picture for uh, sustainable development for China. We will maintain the uh, relatively high, high, higher uh, growth rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this confidence will help the world economic uh, development. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is a very, a very, very important message for mm -hmm. today's uh, world economy. For the uh, globalization in China, uh, we think, uh, in my personal view, uh, uh, I think the uh, globalization is inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's good for, uh, for the world economy uh, development. Mm -hmm. In my company, we have uh, uh, access 
in uh, seven in six countries. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, take the share. Uh, we have to, uh, taken the shares of the assets for the transmission and the distribution assets, mm -hmm. and uh, we are going to continue. Mm -hmm. We hope uh, the globalization will move very uh, uh, normal and then no obligation for the investment. But, but you must be worried that yeah. while Chinese people are believing in globalization, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the markets to whom you sell are urging their governments to close borders. No, no. So, so you, will con you will need um, the cooperation of those other, those other countries. Yeah. To continue. Yes, we need a cooperation with uh, international internationally. Mm. So, uh, if, uh, for my company, we are looking. We are still looking for some opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, cooperate with our uh, in the in the energy sector. So we are looking for that. Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, some questions are coming in from the audience. I have to say, lots of them. And I'm going to throw this to all the panel, and the bravest one will put his or her hand up first. But the questions are quite a lot about when will the usual prescriptions of education and entrepreneurship um, be recognized as not good enough? We've heard this every year at Davos. Mark, let me, let me throw that one, or Vishal, Mark and Vishal. You know, You've both mentioned education ne never. and entrepreneurship. Simple, simple answer to that, never. Education and entrepreneurship are the correct answers. The reason that we keep hearing about these over and over again is we are just not doing enough of these. Mm -hmm. uh, we, there, there is no other answer. The, everything that we have learned to do is something that we have learned to do. It is, there is no magic here. Uh, all these technologies that are reshaping the world around us, all these movements have to be trained. We have, people have to be trained on these. People have to be mm -hmm. taught these. There is no magic to it. Um, entrepreneurship, why is entrepreneurship import, important? I think you have, you know, uh, all, all of us here are entrepreneurs. Mark's example that Mark talked about is an example of entrepreneurship and of giving. Um, the, the solution seems straightforward. Um, it is in the implementation of these that uh, is where all the, the magic is. Um, to, in my mind, you know, John McCarthy, the father of artificial intelligence, once said that articulating a problem is half the solution. We are rapidly approaching a time where AI is going to be able to solve the problems that we can articulate mechanically. Uh, the human frontier is problem finding. And today we still live in a time where, you know, innovation or entrepreneurship is something that is viewed as a mystical thing that, that is available to a chosen few people, that there are the entrepreneurs who come out of somewhere and then they invent things. But the reality is that the act of invention is something that can be taught. Um, people can be trained to see something that is not there and that if it was there, it would improve the world. And this is an act of entrepreneurship. So um, education and entrepreneurship are the answer. We just aren't doing enough of it. Okay, so Mark, uh, you're, you're nodding, but across, that, across well, the United yeah. States and Europe, there's been a mutiny mm -hmm. this last year, a revolution. Um, yeah, I'd like to go back to your last is, question first, which is yeah, that... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking about yeah, that. Okay. So is it that people are just not doing the education and entrepreneurship? Uh, well, I think you've got two different things going on. I think one is we're going to have to exactly what Vishal said, number one, is we're going to have to continue to explore uh, new models of education. Certainly in the United States, our public school system uh, needs all of our attention. I have encouraged you know, every CEO to adopt a public school in the United States. We've, I've done that. I've, you know, uh, our company has also adopted a, a public school district. Obviously, there's going to have to be new models of education, including vocational training, new ideas, things that have been pioneered here in Switzerland. But that may not be enough. We may also have to bifurcate to basic income as well. And that is something that you're hearing a little bit here at the conference. We've heard that. Um, uh, in Guy Standing's uh, session here, in his work, uh, we see those basic income experiments happening. Even where I am in Oakland, uh, funded by the CEO of Y Combinator, Sam Altman, we've seen them in other parts of Europe, in Africa, um, in India as well. I think that is going to be potentially something that's going to have to be explored. Uh, we're, in, we're entering some new territories. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it time for a new code 
for private sector leaders. You know, some would say that we've come through a kind of cowboy period, frontier period, mm -hmm. um, where anything goes because the benefits will eventually trickle down. But do you think we're now on the threshold of a different code? Well, I mean, that's why we're here at the World Economic Forum, where mm -hmm. this forum is built on something that I believe is absolutely critical for the future, which is stakeholder theory. Mm -hmm. That CEOs can pivot to this idea that they're all about shareholders and that the business of business is business, or CEOs can pivot to stakeholder theory, which is what Professor Schwab pioneered uh, in the early 70s and built this forum on, which is that a CEO has to take care of many stakeholders, not just the shareholders, but their, of course, customers, partners, employees, um, as well as their local community, their schools, the environment. These are all stakeholders. And as leaders, modern leaders here at this forum, we have to think about stakeholder theory um, as, I think, one of our key paths forward. Certainly, we're in the, the engaging in multi-stakeholder dialogues, especially when you see all kinds of different voices emerging in the world, some that we might like, some that we might not like, but only through multi-stakeholder dialogue will we be able to elevate um, our consciousness and get to these answers. We are um, going through a, a major shift mm -hmm. in the world. Everybody here knows that. And so these are some of the answers. One of the reasons that I love coming mm -hmm. to this conference, mm -hmm. by the way, is because it's built on that foundation. And I'd like to ask each of you, because you are all regulars, with the exception of Chairman Xu, who it's a delight to have with us this year. But so you come to the World Economic Forum and you do get this opportunity to debate values, challenges. Could you each give us an example of something that you've gone away and either thought differently about or changed in your own company as a result? Mukesh, do you have a, th a thought on that? Well, I'll just... Uh Add a few a few years ago, right? We changed the <clears throat> as uh, our own company became big and came out of uh, our own interactions. That uh, for a company, it's very important to generate societal value, <laughs> right? All of us live in society. Society gives you a license to operate in a business, and until you add value to that, mm -hmm. you just cannot do it only for your shareholders or your employees mm -hmm. or you know, you have to make a difference, and uh, we started measuring that, and we mm -hmm. now uh, publish that, and we make sure that uh, everybody understands that uh, uh, societal value is important because that is important for sustainability. Mm -hmm. Because on an ongoing basis, the corporation can survive. Mm -hmm. So that's one example that mm -hmm. came out of uh, interactions here, mm -hmm. where we changed in the last uh, four mm -hmm. or five years. Mm -hmm. Mary, what, what, would, what would your example be, or what would you want this year's leaders to take away and do differently? Well, I think uh, it really gets to truly focusing on the customer and solving real issues. And I think, you know, you talk, when you really see an issue that you can solve, um, that that's when people innovate. And it's not just entrepreneurs in, in you know, one area of the country or the world, it, but it's everyone in their job of how do they make it better? How do they really focus on the customer? And I think also um, looking at all of the stakeholders. And so I, I think those are two things. At, at General Motors, we very much, you know, we, we say we want to be the most valued automotive company, but it's not valuable to just our owners, but we feel as we um, work and, and have strong relationships and, and do the right thing across all of our stakeholders, that in the end will be the best solution mm -hmm. for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. But the, the core of that starts with the customer and truly focusing on what is really going to add value to the customer, going to improve improve their life. And when you get a whole organization, 220,000 people looking at how do, I, how do I improve every day, make it better, and focus on making decisions around the customer, um, it really energizes the entire company. Mm -hmm. But, and I on the to just add to what Mary said because she's been an advocate for this and I think that one of the key stakeholders in the world is women. You know, if we look at where we are in gender equality, the World Economic Forum has said it's going to take another, like something like 170 years to get to parity with men. We don't have time to wait. <laughs> you know, every CEO needs to look at are you paying men and women the same? That, that is something that every CEO can do today. We all have modern human resource management systems, but as a CEO, are you willing to 
step up and say, I pay men and women the same. I'm providing not only equal opportunity and equal advancement, but also equal pay. That, that's, I think, a major shift to empower women in, in society is, mm -hmm. I think, critical part of the voice in, in mm -hmm. getting that across. Mm -hmm. Vishal, can I come to you? I mean, this is a particular year because as, as I keep repeating, you know, there has been a mutiny. What's, what's the thing that you think leaders should take away this year? I think that um, the two things that, so Mark earlier talked about the giving that his company does and mm -hmm. has exemplified. We have to ask ourselves, do we all do something of that sort mm -hmm. and, and do that? The, um, how, how much do we invest in training? Uh, in Australia, they recently put in a, a law to get 1% of the uh, salaries or income uh, for tra employee training. Uh, how many of us are doing that? Um, the, I think that this idea of designing systems for a for a for few is something that we have to abandon, and we have to design systems, products, and services for everyone, especially for the have-nots. Um, we we have that is a and that requires a unique commitment to empathy. Uh, to un and design thinking is an example of this. Mm -hmm. uh, designing car, Mary talked about this, uh, designing cars and, um, and systems of that sort with the end user in mind, uh, including the displaced people. The, I think that the asymmetry in technology, I mean, if you just look at uh, the top five companies in the world by market cap now are technology companies. And, and I always wonder, why isn't every company a technology company? Um, what is it about technology? We all learn technology, you know, it did not drop from the skies. We learn technology and we learn to build it. Um, why can't we bring this idea of um, building technology for everyone, um, for, for all of us? So I think inclusive technology, uh, creating access to these things, we should as corporations, as CEOs, as leaders, stop waiting around for somebody else to come and tell us to do things or um, for, for somebody else to do them for us and instead take the initiative and do, in doing these things ourselves. And can I pick up with that? Because you're talking about inclusive technology. Now what we can see the digital revolution has done is polarized societies, created echo chambers, people only talking to people who agree with them and their views become magnified and polarized. We all live in very diverse societies. This is very dangerous terrain where society, instead of pulling more together, is fragmenting and pulling apart. Is there a software solution to that? Um, the not software for cause. <laughs> software for collaboration, you know, uh, one of the, um, so the answer to that is again yes and no. The, um, in the early days, when the memo was written to create um, the internet, um, JCR Licklider wrote this memo called uh, Connecting the um, the interplanetary, the intergalactic communication network. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea, because he, he thought that, you know, engineers will try to lowball things and then they will build a network for the planet. Um, and which is what we ended up doing with the internet over the last 40, 50 years. Um, the, uh, so on the one hand, technology has connected us in an extraordinary way. Uh, if you just look at how well, how deeply connected we all are as a society now, I mean, um, we had the opportunity to work with Mukesh Bhai on his new venture in Geo, and there are now something like, in the last four months, 80 million people in India who are subscribers of Geo. Um, so technology has an incredible ability to connect us and, uh, um, and unite us. And yet, a software for collaboration is something that is still in a very primitive state. If you look at the way we do our word processing or um, uh, you know, crunching, uh, capturing information and so forth. It is still largely the same as it has been for the last 30 years or so. Uh, technology to really help us collaborate, to help us achieve a shared perspective, a shared meaning, is, is still in early stages. We still have to come together to places like Davos and, and sit together to really understand what is going on. We don't yet have software that helps us get there more conveniently. So it is, on the one hand, yes, and on the other hand, it is still early. And, and the counter narrative to that is that software is also dividing us. Mm -hmm. yes. Certainly you can see in social media, especially in regards to recent events that I don't have to go into in detail, that um, the software was used in many cases to divide society. Uh, bots were created to take on uh, anonymous uh, positions in social media that look like 
humans amplifying um, uh, narratives that may not have been true. And that is an example where the technology is dividing us. Mm -hmm. So this, again, this is a new frontier. This is also part of the fourth industrial revolution. When we look at what has social media done to us, yes, we like to be on Twitter. We get real-time feedback. I'm getting that right here. I'm looking at what people are saying and what they want me to respond to, just as you are on your iPad. And of course, that's part of the fourth industrial revolution. But the other side of it is there's also account, um, all kinds of intelligence and, and network uh, capability that's out there trying to push society in a certain direction. That is new. That's certainly something that we really have not seen happen before. So, but solutions from Mark or from anyone on the panel, you know, that this is dangerous stuff when the technologies become magnifiers of fear, of hatred of others, of polarization. Because we know that when people are afraid, they don't work together. And that means that they turn to governments, as it were, that don't permit them to work together, that control them and coerce them. So this is a, this is a pretty important moment mm -hmm. for, so are there solutions? If the technology is the driver of this, are there technology solutions for it? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a technology solution, but I think now more than ever, corporations, governments, communities, and Mark said this before, we have to work together and, you know, and, and, and demonstrate and, and look at some of the broader issues that society as a whole, the world is facing uh, and, and take action. I mean, in the auto industry, you know, one of the things we feel very responsible for is how do we improve the environment and, and the investments that we're making in the technology leadership. So I think is if, you know, governments, countries, um, communities, if we work together to solve some of these issues and solve some of the bigger problems, I think it demonstrates, you know, that we can work together. I don't know if there's a software solution for people stepping back and wanting to listen and wanting to understand another point of view and respecting another point of view, even if it's not theirs. And, but I, I think there's a role that we can play that we have to work together in a way we haven't um, to this point. Mm -hmm. Chairman Shu, can I come to you? Because an, an underlying theme um, of this mutiny is that international cooperation itself could be at risk. And you've led on international cooperation in technology yeah. in the IEC. Um, what is most at risk there? Why, why is it that we really need international cooperation on technology in your sector? I mean, it's nice to have, but is there any part of it that is absolutely essential? Yes. Uh, I have been working uh, for IEC for uh, many years. IEC stands for International Electrotechnical Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, products of the IEC is uh, uh, standards. Standards, uh, uh, standards can uh, promote the international uh, trade mm -hmm. with uh, 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 mm -hmm. technical, uh, mm -hmm. technology standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, IEC now has uh, over 20,000 mm -hmm. expertise, engineers mm -hmm. from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the IEC standardization, uh, we, uh, the manufacturers and uh, en uh, the labs and uh, they can manufacture, man, manufacture their products according to mm -hmm. a unique mm -hmm. standardization. Mm -hmm. This is much helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to become more difficult, though? Uh, and, and not really difficult, because uh, IEC was founded in 1906, mm -hmm. 110 years mm -hmm. already. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a very, a very good uh, mm -hmm. Work a proce mm -hmm. working procedure, mm -hmm. everyone can participate mm -hmm. for the uh, standardization development. It's a very uh, 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 standard, uh, uh, we mean, it's, the standards are produced by uh, consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, people will uh, uh, agree, uh, every, everyone, every expert will uh, have to be agree with mm -hmm. the, uh, standards. And so. how important to that process is the fact that you all know each other? Yes. 
I mean, how long, how long would you say the engineers in this group have been getting together from different countries? How long have you known your fellow engineers? Yeah, uh, uh, the IEC uh, worked, uh, uh, they divided many groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we called it, uh, uh, we called uh, uh, it uh, uh, technical committee, mm -hmm. TCs. Mm -hmm. in, in the TC, they, mm -hmm. uh, they are working in the speci mm -hmm. uh, specific area. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, like uh, electrical, ele uh, electrical cars, mm -hmm. the, uh, the engineers come mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they meet uh, several times mm -hmm. in, in a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, for one uh, standard, it may take several years to, mm -hmm. uh, to, f uh, uh, to finish a, st a standards. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a very careful mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, mm -hmm. standardization, mm -hmm. I should say. Yeah. No, 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 no difficult. People mm -hmm. are very uh, enthusiastic mm -hmm. to participate mm -hmm. the standardization mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. we, 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 can't, we can't say any difficult to, uh, to do it. Yeah. Right. It's, a, it's a very important and interesting reflection because a lot of us are watching the more visible aspects of international cooperation um, at risk or breaking down. And that basic insight of people knowing one another, yeah. coming together, yes. trusting one another, yeah, right. and forging standards, or as Mark put it, coming to Davos each year, knowing one another, looking at each other in the face, coming to you know, raise the standard of what you expect of yourself what you expect to do for the society around you. Could I ask you, before we close, I'd just like one sentence from each of you about what you think leaders across the private or the public sector or both, what is it that leaders should do differently this year as a result of the wake-up call of the last year? Um, two, two things come to my mind. Uh, one is, uh, resolve to bring access to uh, new technologies uh, to everyone. And second one is resolve to create a billion entrepreneurs. Mark. Well, I've told you one thing, which is I think that every CEO needs to adopt a, a public school. I, I really think that you know, we're gonna pivot to where each of us are, is gonna have to take personal action to overcome the kind of um, um, levels of, of inequality that we're seeing. As we kind of head back to our hometowns, wherever they are, you know, you don't have to go very far, even in San Francisco, where I am, where I can find, you know, very high levels of inequality. I think that everybody has to really focus on this and take this seriously and, and do one thing. It could be adopt a school, it, it, it could be working more closely with an NGO. Um, that there's a commitment I think that each of us has to make to kind of get to the, move this ball uh, forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mukesh. Well, I think that uh, last year it was about understanding the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. This year it's about implementing them, keeping in mind that uh, prosperity and benefit to all people, and people are always above technology. Embracing these technologies for the benefit of the people is our challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with what all the panelists have said, and you know, clearly uh, the foundation of education and innovation entrepreneurship, but I also think we have an obligation to go back and uh, you know, one very uh, tangible thing we can do is is really talk about biases. Everyone has biases, and you know how do we? Um, if you, once you realize you have them, then you you know you can start to look and, and see people in a different light. And uh, you know work with Cheryl Sandberg and lean in on understanding bias. It's it's training now we're doing at General Motors to improve our business. But I think it, it, it expands because once you you start to see that in yourself, it, it I think it expands to not only you know where you work but your communities and how you can you know really start to embrace different points of view. So I think, you know, in addition to, to education, we, we really have to challenge ourselves, everyone, and there's things co corporations can do from a training perspective to get people to, to, to have a more open view and to, 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 to listen and to understand others. 
Thank you. Chairman Xu. Yeah. Uh, last year, we uh, still agreed uh, has uh, uh, done two things, mainly. One is uh, renewable energy development. Mm -hmm. uh, in our uh, company, we have uh, over 200 megawatt renewable energy. Uh, part of uh, 1.3, uh, 130 uh, megawatt for the wind power and uh, over 700 uh, megawatt for the solar power. That's uh, uh, our last year efforts. The second one is uh, uh, rural electrification. So we have uh, people uh, to have a more reliable power supply. But for the, this year, we will focus, focus on the one belt, one road. One belt, one road uh, initiatives. We will uh, uh, cooperate, cooperate with uh, neighbor countries and, the, and the some other, uh, and the other countries uh, for the infrastructure connectivity. That's how uh, this year uh, I for, uh, focus. Thank you very much. I think tonight's discussion and your comments and questions really highlight that in some countries of the world, particularly what some would call Western democracies, there has been a mutiny, but in others, there has not been. And those are the countries that, are, as it were, are still focused on delivering more and better, just as Chairman Xu and Mukesh and Vishal have pointed to. But I think in all of these countries, there is still a lesson from the last year, and I'd just like to come back to that as a rallying call for this year's Davos, which is that citizens are not just consumers. You can't just deliver to them, whether it's in Chinese factories or on the streets of India, fighting corruption, whatever it is, or whether it's the young, disaffected, unemployed men in Europe who are joining terrorist organizations. Why? A huge part is a sense, a human need to belong and a human need to be heard. And if humans are not belonging to their national community or the narrative that their government sets for them, they will find others and those others will jeopardize a lot of what most of us care about. So I think it's for Davos this year to bring all of this innovation, these ideas about how you bring people with you, Mary's ideas about how to do that in GM, Mark and Vishal's ideas about the values that you can, that you can bring behind that, uh, Mukesh and Chairman Shu's ideas about the way they're delivering better. We need to bring all of that innovative energy to really thinking about how we can support communities locally and nationally to, to create a system in which people feel they belong and feel that they're being heard. Now you could say, I would say that, I'm the dean of a school of government, but government is absolutely central to that because it's governments that use words, that create narratives, which either help people feel they belong, help them feel they've got a voice or don't. And I think that's the innovation I'd love to see come out of Davos. But could you join me in thanking um, and appreciating each of our panelists for terrific contributions this evening. Thank you all.